Hey guys, you're watching The Crypto Future. My name is Teddy, and today I want to talk about Cytomask and what exactly is going on. I have a little bit of technical background that I think I can provide some insight, but maybe not answer all the questions. Um, and I just want to go from there. So if that's something you're interested in, stick around. <laughs> Hey guys, Teddy here. So I do want to talk briefly about my background. So what do I do? I am a solutions architect. My expertise goes in developing enterprise applications that have high traffic and high volume of users, anywhere from 500,000 to millions of uh, concurrent users at a time. And the way I got into this field was through uh, college. I got landed on a project that required uh, me to code the Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare. So I went right into a company called Accenture. I, uh, you know, really got my knowledge to where it is now. So that way I could understand all portions of an enterprise level application. From there, I went into something called the cloud uh, computing world and more specifically AWS, Amazon Web Services, which is also what Cytomask uses in their underlying architecture. The way I found this out is I went to a Twitter space uh, that was being held by the cryptologist who was running the space and he was taking questions from people. One of the first questions that was asked when I was there was there was another technical expert who went into the space and flat out asked them technical questions like, hey, what are you guys using in the back end? What's happening? And what, what can he do or what are they doing to help get them back on track? One of the funniest things that was said was the guy cryptologist was saying, hey, we are having a bot attack. We're having a denial of service attack and we're unable to find uh, why we're having this attack. And as soon as I hear this, you know, me being from the background that I'm in, I'm like, when someone tells me they're having a denial of service attack, I step back and I'm like, wait, they're using Amazon Web Services as their back end. If you're using AWS, right, Amazon Web Services, how can you say you have a bot attack or you're unable to bring an application up from a bot attack? One, they're either lying and there really is no bot attack, or two, they are telling you the truth and this bot attack is so sophisticated that no one has the expertise to help them out to help mitigate the attack, which is crazy, right? Amazon as a whole, Amazon.com uses AWS in their backend to help with uh, doing services to the Amazon layer. At any given time, there are millions upon millions of people using Amazon.com. Now let's assume that Amazon.com has a bot attack. If you know millions of users are using this Amazon.com, you don't think that AWS would shut down Amazon.com because millions of uh, bots are coming in and using Amazon.com? No, Amazon.com is smart enough to know, hey, these are legitimate traffic, and even though the volume is high, that traffic is legitimate. So now, let's bring this back to Satamask. So Satamask goes to launch. So I was there for the launch. I watched Max. I watched the other guy next to him. I watched uh, Russ, and literally it goes, hey, the app is live. And you see Russ's face, you see Max's face, they're like, yep, it's live. And I've been in this situation before on a go live production date and me being in IT, as soon as an app goes live, it's the most exciting feeling. And that was shown. They were happy. They finally got to the five o'clock Eastern time. They released the app. Where things start to change. One, there was no acknowledgement of whether this app was working or not. The entire time during the stream, Russ goes to Max and goes, hey, Max, people are saying that there are issues or they're having a network connection issues. At this time, Max just goes, no, there's no issues. Everything's working fine. Me being in IT, that is such an IT thing to do. And when you go and you know there's an IT problem, you go to the IT service desk or wherever you need to, the first thing an IT guy is going to tell you is like, no, problem's not on our end. It must be you, not us. And even if it is their end, most of the time they will not admit it because I haven't admitted it myself and there's been plenty of things that I have messed up on and had to fix and roll out. So I see this whole situation happen and within I would say eight, nine minutes after five o'clock, 
especially when I got into the app itself and I noticed the network connection error, I'm like, hey, my mind is telling me there is a problem. And then Russ tries it himself on stream and says, oh yeah, I cannot get it. And this is the most interesting comment. At this time, Max goes, well, everything's working fine. Let's wrap up the call. Um, things need to propagate and increase so we can handle the volume of traffic coming in. Okay, fine. Stream ends. So at this point, all I know is I have an app. They have made it live. I can download it. I can't register. I can't log in. I don't receive emails with the verification code. And I'm just getting bombarded with network connection issue, network connection issue. So with my background in Amazon Web Services, one of the first things I did was try and research really, hey, what are they using in the back end? And in this cryptologist Twitter space that opened up a few hours after this live uh, rollout on YouTube, they basically got onto the same end. The guy cryptologist goes, oh, so we're using API Gateway. API Gateway is an Amazon web service that is used as a way to deliver data to a server and data back from a server. So when I heard the term API Gateway, one of the main things with API Gateway is API Gateway is actually uh, serverless. What serverless means is that it can adapt to scale. It can make your idea uh, much quicker and it lowers cost, right? So one of the main things with serverless is there's no physical server. Uh, Amazon basically runs the data or runs your API for you at any edge location. They return you the data that you need at any given time. And there's really no cost to run that program on a server where you're paying 24 by seven uh, to run a server. So in serverless, anytime an API is invoked, so you press login, that login data that has a username and password, that time it took from you pressing login to hit the Amazon, um, the Amazon region and then back to you, that's the only time you're getting charged in AWS. So we know Amazon as a company runs AWS in the back end and we know Satamask as a company is running Amazon in the back end. Satamask volume is maybe 300,000 uh, if that's the amount of holders and maybe it's more, let's say 600,000 just to be uh, nice, right? So now let's assume they have 600,000 uh, users that are concurrently hitting this API. Well guys, I'm showing you right here, serverless on AWS, build and run applications without thinking about servers. So we know they're using API Gateway, which is a serverless technology which runs on AWS. And what does serverless do? It moves, um, it adapts, it lowers your cost, and you can build better applications easier. I use API Gateway myself. I have API Gateway, I have a Lambda backend. I can literally build APIs like anything. What I don't understand is how API Gateway is the reason, or regardless, how a bot attack is happening through API Gateway. The amount of traffic API Gateway can handle is unfathomable. Like it is so big because that entire region, wherever it may be, is getting network traffic from all different areas of the world. It's not just for Satamask. So you're telling me that upon the millions of traffic that Amazon's already getting for their Amazon.com, plus Satamask's 600,000, let's say, traffic that Satamask is getting, somehow someone in Amazon goes, oh, this is a bot attack of these 600,000 things that are coming in and going directly to this account ID in Amazon and it's Satamask and that's that's a bot attack. You guys need to shut it down or we're gonna shut it down for you, which is usually what happens. If Amazon says, hey, you're doing a denial of service attack or there's denial of service attacks happening to your servers in your AWS environment, Amazon will send you a meal, email and say, hey, we're gonna have to shut you down if you don't mitigate within 24 hours. At this time, a company usually has one thing. Hey, why am I getting a denial of service attack? Can I block an IP? So in this Amazon Twitter space, Cryptologist actually goes, oh, we weren't using Amazon Shield and Amazon 
uh, WAF, a WAF filter, which is very well used in the industry to regulate IP addresses, to add rules and regex operations to IP addresses to allow certain IPs to come in and certain IPs to go out. Well, upon enabling this, Cryptologist says another thing. Hey, so now we've enabled the WAF filter, which is an Amazon uh, solution, as well as uh, the uh, AWS Shield. So we're feeling good. They're, they're very happy, you know? And I'm going, okay, so now you've enabled the WAF filter and the Shield. Why did you not enable this before going live? Like, what is causing you to go, hey, uh, one of the reasons that I'm not able to uh, figure out whether this is a bot attack is I don't even know where the IP addresses are coming from. I can't tell what's legitimate and what's not legitimate. So when I hear this, to me, as soon as someone says we can't tell on a AWS infrastructure whether something is legitimate or not, I would say every single traffic is probably legitimate and what they didn't anticipate for is the volume. Because they were using all these serverless uh, architecture and they're trying to save uh, time and money, I personally feel that that one of the one of the things that they did is they used this uh, service called Amazon uh, Service Simple Email Service, Amazon SES. So what Amazon SES does is they send emails out to clients and it's very similar to API Gateway. Amazon SES basically um, does high scale inbound and outbound emails and there's two modes that Amazon SES is in. There's a test mode and there's a production mode. Amazon will not turn SES to production mode till you put in a request, it gets approved and you tell them how much traffic or volume you're anticipating for emails being sent out. When you're in test mode with Amazon SES, so you have now, you've told Amazon that, yep, I have serverless, I have API gateway, I can send an API call to Amazon, I get it back. But what Amazon has is this other service, Amazon SES, to send email. So now I've registered, but now I want to send an email. Usually, in order to speed things up, people just flat out write the call for the email, and the email goes right out. But in production mode, when the email service is in production mode, it is not good practice to just call out the SES server as is, because if that uh, service call to the SES fails, you are going to get bad um, email traffic and Amazon at that point notices hey there's a lot of failures in this SES call people aren't getting their emails what's going on and they may put a block on the email service which is something you could not account for when SES was in test mode in test mode when you're testing the emails and you're developing an app you only get like five or six accounts that you can test for and you can make a few dummy emails here and there you can even give it to Certic and let them know hey we only send emails from this email address and that's it, right? They configure that, they let Certic try it, and then they go to production mode. But what they forget to implement is an SQS. Uh, an SQS is a simple queue service that Amazon also offers in order to not hit the SES all at the same time where the invocations look like, hey, this is a bot attack or this is fake. There shouldn't be 300,000 people hitting the SES service to give them the verification email at once. So what you do is you put in a queue called Amazon SQS. And with this queue, every time people hit register, it goes into a queue. That queue waits till the processing is available for SES. Then it'll read that, okay, so from API Gateway, we know this user um, registered and this queue will now hit another function and goes, hey, this person needs an email, send it out. Is the email service ready? Yep, it's ready, send out the email. And it goes on till it's done with the entire queue. That's the best way to not overwhelm Amazon's SES service and their team, so that way they don't block you. This is one of the areas where I feel that they 100% got blocked because the amount of um, requests that I'm reading where people aren't getting emails, that's what that tells me. So I've talked about a Amazon Gateway and the AWS SES which sends email. But what's missing is not me explaining to you what I think this could be, but the admittance from Saitama to say, hey, this is because the only thing that Saitama has told us from now uh, 
from the release till now is it's not our fault this is related to something else and someone else is causing this uh, mess it's not their fault definitely not their fault and i'm a developer i'm in this technology space i make applications of this level if not greater and to hear that a small uh, amount of bots or IP addresses cannot be verified and they're having this much trouble to launch an Android application or an Apple Play Store application is just unfathomable. The other fun thing is not only do they say it's not on them, they also say, hey, we need to push an update to the Apple Store so that way the changes can be effective. But keep in mind, guys, these guys flat out told us that, hey, once five o'clock rolls around, we hit a button, everyone's good to go. Not everyone was good to go. Not everyone got to experience the greatness that Certic got to experience to say, yep, this app is ready for prime time, because it was not. And I felt this could have been easily avoided if the team had done a performance test. One performance test would have prevented all of this. Even one performance test in the production environment before opening it up to people. Maybe they tested in the dev and um, the dev environment where they developed the application, but they never did a true rollout in production. This could have been one of the areas you should have done that. And you could have realized that, hey, we have a bottleneck or we just got shut down or people didn't receive emails. Something's going on. Now, let's say you get a, a token sniffer or a web traffic sniffer type application and you try to look at the packets that that SATA mask is using when they do the API calls to Amazon API gateway. There's nothing in there. It's always the same exact uh, traffic. It's always like Saitama API dot something dot com. And it's like, guys, it doesn't matter about the API calls itself. We need to know what the issue is. I personally do not believe this is a bot attack. Nowhere in this environment of AWS I believe a bot attack would stop you. I would really, I wanna see their information. I wanna see what's making them say that this is a true bot attack. And that's where my mind, that's where my head really resides because I don't trust them. I don't believe them at this point. I am now at the point of like, they didn't have AWS WAF on. They didn't have AWS Shield, which is a firewall on. They didn't even do a performance test from what we can see. 300,000 users in the Amazon space is nothing. There are applications that receive more user base that have to deal with more bots than Satamask, and they're running today. So if anyone believes that Saitama is 100% um, doing right by us and they, and they got this and it's not on them, they are crazy because you do have to take some responsibility for the bots to release. You cannot just say, that, hey, we did everything right, when clearly the at 93% of people applying on this app cannot get into the app. So that's really where my head's at. I know this is a big ramble and I know it's a little on the technical side, but I really felt that you guys should hear where my head's at, why I'm feeling I'm being lied to by Saitama's team. And I'm okay, I can be wrong. And when I'm provided with new information, my views may change. But till that information comes in, Right now, I'm not feeling that Saitama is telling us the truth, and I really want to know why. So guys, if you like this type of content, please like and subscribe, comment down below. Do you believe Saitama? Are you with me? <laughs> Where's your head at? I respond to every single comment, so really looking forward to see what you guys say down below. So guys, thanks for watching, and till next time.